Welcome, welcome, welcome in everyone. Welcome to Care Concierge with Care Patrol, where education is the heart of everything we do. Thank you so much for being here today. Our topic is the DSM-5 and the ethics of diagnosis. We appreciate you joining us here. This is our last CEU offering this year, and we look forward to sharing the hour with you. If you're not familiar with Care Patrol, we're aging care navigators, meaning that we meet people where they are on their journey in healthcare, whether that's a planning stage or from the hospital or rehab room. Uh, and we help them understand what's next in their future in terms of their payment, insurance, Medicaid, Medicare, VA pay payments, or other things, as well as what providers are in the area and which providers are highly rated, both using various different data as well as our own 13 years experience. And we do all of this at no charge. So if you have clients who have questions that uh, you can't seem to, to get them to understand, maybe we could as a secondary voice. So we'd love to help anyone that needs help. We're only paid if we help people find assisted living or independent living or sitters in their home, but we end up helping a whole bunch of people who have other needs and we do so at no charge. So we hope you'll continue to use us. Thank you for your referrals. It keeps us in business and we appreciate it. Uh, our topic was suggested by our form, or one of our former attendees or a few of them actually, uh, we ask in our evaluation what topics you would like to see us try to do. Try is the emph emphasized word. Uh, try to do. And this was one that seemed to be timely and helpful. Uh, and hopefully it will be for you. We do encourage discussion. So we hope you'll join us in the chat room. If you're somewhat new to Zoom and you're not familiar with the chat room, move your cursor up to the top of your screen and a little black bar should pop down. If not, move your cursor to the bottom of the screen and a little black box will pop up and the word chat is on there. Click that box and say hello. Um, you must do our evaluation in order to get credit for being here today. The evaluation is password protected and we give the password out at the end today. Um, so I will read for those of you who are joining us by phone or not in front of your screen. I'm going to read for you now the evaluation link. Remember, it's password protected, and we give the password out at the end. The link is https colon forward slash forward slash www dot survey monkey dot com forward slash lowercase r forward slash all uppercase letters y h five n as in nancy h g as in girl p as in play that is our evaluation link. You must do the evaluation to receive credit. We're accredited by the Alabama Board of Social Work and also by the Alabama Board of Nursing to provide 1.0 contact hour for today's unit. Um, and we will be uploading nursing hours for you onto the ABN. Everyone who does the evaluation will receive a certificate in the email. Please try and do the evaluations today if you can by eight o'clock. I understand sometimes you can't get to it, but if you can, please get it done and I can get those certificates out sooner. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. And uh, this will be, as I said, our last CEU of the year as next Monday is Christmas. So for those of you who are celebrating, Merry Christmas. Uh, I know those of you, some of you may already be celebrating Hanukkah or Kwanzaa. Wish you a happy holidays, everyone. And thank you for being with us here all year long. We look forward to a new year with you. Our objectives for today for the DSM-5 and the ethics of diagnosis are objective one, to detail a brief history of the DSM and to choose, uh, and brief is the operative word. Uh, two, we want to describe some advantages and disadvantages of using the DSM to diagnose. 
Uh, and thirdly, we're going to pose throughout a series of ethical questions to you uh, for you to assist or to decide how best to use the DSM in your own practice. Hello, everyone. I'm posting again here in the chat room for those of you who are paying attention to it. The uh, survey evaluation link for the day. Remember, it's password protected. We give the password out at the end of the day. Hello to everyone. Thank you for speaking and joining in the discussion. There'll be lots of opportunities to continue doing so, including this one. How familiar are you with the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, or DSM? Please share in the chat room. How familiar are you with the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, or DSM? Please share in the chat room. So the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association is in its fifth edition. It is a primary method of classification used. Familiar, yes, had some exposure, very familiar, worked in child psych for 13 years. Oh, Miss Robbins, you do have much deeper familiarity than I. I hope this uh, hour is worth it to you. Somewhat pretty familiar, familiar, some. I see we're sort of all over the board in terms of our familiarity, somewhat, 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 somewhat. Oh, a lot of somewhat. So we're, we're somewhat familiar. I use it as a refresher as I don't use it regularly. Well, good. I hope this is a good hour for everyone. So in the DSM, diagnose, diagnosis or diagnosing is a process of gathering information, understanding condition, linking that information with the knowledge in the DSM about the various cognitive, emotional, and behavioral conditions. It's commonly referenced by social workers, as you've already stated, uh, particularly those in the mental health field, like Ms. Robbins. Uh, the standards provide a general framework that promote uniformity and serves as a resource uh, both for clinicians and for researchers. So approximately every 10 years, the APA publishes revision to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, or DSM. The last edition was DSM-5 uh, in 2013, and it had specific diagnostic criteria for mental disorders in a series of codes that allow therapists to both easily summarize often complex conditions and allow them to bill. It has a number of advantages, mostly the standardization of diagnoses across providers, but it has some drawbacks. We'll discuss a few. The one, the most paramount being that it leads to overdiagnosis. Would any of you agree that it leads to overdiagnosis? And it's sometimes referred to as psychiatry's Bible but its use in social work has been controversial. The roots of the DSM are traceable to the late 19th century, but it really took hold following World War II as the Veterans Affairs Department in the U.S. needed a way to diagnose and treat returning service members who had a whole wide range of mental health difficulties due to their wartime service. In 1949, the World Health Organization released its sixth edition of the International Classification of Diseases, or ICD, which for the first time in that edition included mental health diseases. But this was far from complete. In 1952, the APA published the DSM-1 which was based on work done by the World uh, Armed Forces during World War II and was designed for use by doctors. The DSM-2 was released in 1968, so about 16 years later, and it was heavily influenced by the psychoanalytic analytic concepts that were prevalent at that time, mostly Freudian psychotherapy. And uh, that edition coincided with the eighth revision of the ICD. So generally we see that the DSM revisions coincide with revisions to the ICD. Uh, in 1980, the DSM-3 was released and its goal was to provide and prove the validity of the diagnoses and standardize them. It was the first version to have a multi-axis system 
and also explicit diagnostic criteria. Uh, and the DSM-3, however, uh, in homosexuality was diagnosed as ego dystonic homosexuality. So when revisions were made to the DSM-4, uh, that specific classification was removed. In the DSM-4, homosexuality was no longer seen as a disorder, although the anxiety and distress about sexual orientation were. The 1994 uh, was the release date of the DSM-4. There were numerous changes. Uh, it was more user-friendly, and the DSM-5 followed in May of 2013. So it represented, like the DSM-4, radical shifts in thinking from the previous editions. In fact, diagnoses were changed or removed altogether, diagnoses added, and the organizational structure underwent a pretty major reworking. So... The DSM-5 is expected to be revised more regularly. However, as you'll note later, it truly has not been. The DSM-5 provided for the grouping of disorders based on etiological factors, such as shared risk or temperament or neurocircuitry, rather than descriptive constellations of symptoms under the AXIS system. There was no more multi-axial system where there were five diagnoses or five aspects of a diagnosis. Instead, diagnoses in the DSM-5 are recorded in a list with the principal diagnosis being first and the others following in order of importance to treatment of the first. And in the DSM-5, they replaced the general assessment of functioning scale with the WHO disability assessment schedule, WHO-DAS. Uh, and it's interesting to note that the codes are the same between the ICD and the DM, DSM. Rather, Asperger's disorder was eliminated in DSM-5, and instead it was incorporated into the autism spectrum disorder. Uh, they changed the symptoms, uh, substance use disorders, and gambling was the only behavioral addiction now. Uh, and then the symptom threshold to many critics for the substance use disorders was set too low. There are 11 symptoms that one might uh, ad ad adhere to any diagnosis or disorder and the severity determined by the number of symptoms. So mild two to three, moderate four to five, severe six plus. Uh, the DSM-5 created a new symptom cluster for PTSD uh, and listed gender dysphoria for the first time, suggesting that gender is on a spectrum and not male nor female only. Other new disorders in the DSM-5 were hoarding disorder, uh, major and minor neurocognitive, disruptive mood, binge eating disorder, which again can be over, or as critics suggest, is overdiagnosed caffeine withdrawal disorder, and cannabis withdrawal disorder. And it uses in the DSM-5 a non-axial system of diagnosis, listing the appropriate diagnoses and medical conditions, medical conditions, excuse me, without axial designations. And the current measure, as we said, for disability is the same as it's in the WHO Disability Assessment 2.0. The most recent edition of the DSM is the fifth addiction text revision or DSM VTR or 5TR. This was published in 2022, nine years after the DSM-5. So we're in keeping with about every decade, there's an update. Uh, and updates of note to social workers in the DSM VTR are the updated descriptions of prevalence, risk, and prognostic factors based on new research. There's a new disorder, prolonged grief disorder, which is F4 3.8. This is the only disorder that you will refer to as a DSM-5 TR disorder, as all other disorders would be referred to as DSM-5 disorders. There was a change in intellectual disability to intellectual development disorder, F70 being mild, F71 moderate, F72 severe, and F73 profound. There's a new category entirely, uh, which is other conditions that may be a focus of clinical attention. 
These include suicidal behavior and non-suicidal self-injury, or NSSI. And there are new codes for initial encounters with someone who has suicidal ideation or attempt, as well as new codes for subsequent encounters with that person and that person's history of suicide attempts. Other notable on gender dysphoria, some of the terminology was changed. So from using the words natal sex to using the terms birth assigned gender, from changing gender reassignment treatments to gender affirming treatments, and from desired gender to experienced gender. Also, the DSM 5 TR includes a definition of cisgender but also suggest that we might use the word non-transgender. Uh, there were updates for the wording in the autism spectrum disorder for criterion A, and there were language changes to reduce racial and cultural biases. So there's the use, for example, of non-stigmatizing language, like the use of the term Latin X, or instead of using the term race or racial, using the term racialized, which highlights the socially constructed nature of race. And it also takes whiteness out of the text by using very less, using the words minority or not using the words non-white. Uh, it describes more how symptoms can manifest in people from different demographic backgrounds. So this is a first. It has new codes for NSSI and suicidal behavior. Uh, and revised diagnostic criteria for 70 disorders from the DSM-5 and added a new diagnosis for long grief. We did a CEU on uh, chronic grief syndrome, which is available uh, on YouTube. If you search YouTube, Sean Barnes, Care Patrol, you will find my page and you can watch about 100 different CEUs for credit. One of those is on chronic grief. So I want to ask then, how do you use, how do you use the DSM? Do you use it as a blueprint? So do you use it in, in keeping in correct line, following it line by line? Do you use it as a blueprint for building and constructing your practice, your assessment, your treatment plan? Or do you use it more as a guideline? So it's a way to keep in the center but using other tools as well to form a diagnosis or a, or a treatment plan? Or do you only use the DSM for billing purposes? Please share how you use the DSM. Do you use it as a blueprint? Do you use it as a guideline? Or do you only use it for billing purposes? So the DSM diagnoses help social workers. Guideline, 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 guideline. Blueprint, Jason Leslie. Guideline, 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 guideline. As a nurse, I use it as a guideline and billing. Guideline, guideline. All of the above, says Ms. Robbins. Well, you have deep experience with it. So it does help social workers and other mental health professionals to understand your clients and guide your interventions on behalf of those clients from an evidence-based perspective. It helps with goal setting, treatment planning, and determining a client's prognosis. These are things you want to do, of course, but you should be cognizant, anyone, of the ethical issues that may arise in the context of using this, uh, particularly for social workers. We will look at how using it may uh, interfere with demonstrating respect for the dignity and worth of all people, empowering clients, practicing with one's, within one's professional competency, as well as how this may affect the primary duty of care. Now, we did say, and we do believe, it is uniquely helpful for several reasons. Standardization, first and foremost, helps, and that helps uh, people afford treatment, even if they have a lack of an ability to pay. The standardization of the unit allows us to treat everyone, regardless of social class or location, provides something concrete that we can use as a guidepost or guideline to assess the effectiveness of the treatment we've proposed. 
Uh, the use of the of the tool helps with guidance in the mental health field, um, ensuring that researchers are studying the same things. Uh, and it helps eliminate a lot of guesswork, providing, if nothing else, a map for you, as you may only see a client once or twice, a handful of times, not long enough to fully understand and engage in their background and their issues. The DSM provides you with a quick reference, a framework within which to try and understand and then find out those individual answers. But it's not without criticism. Oversimplification being the most uh, pronounced uh, criticism as well as the potential for misdiagnosis as well as the risk of labeling or stigmatizing. So many critics say that it's a vast oversimplification of the continuum of human behavior, reducing complex problems to labels and numbers, and this risk losing track of our clients as humans. There's the potential for a misdiagnosis or an overdiagnosis in which we've seen vast groups of people are labeled as having a disorder but simply because in many cases, their behavior is not lined up or not in line with the current ideal. We can look only at childhood attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder to see this. The DSM coincided with a massive upturn in the number of children on Ritalin. And then we do wonder about labeling and stigmatizing our clients. So mental health disorders, while they're not viewed as harshly as they once were, they can still be perceived uh, with labels and they can be perceived with people making judgments about persons based on their diagnosis. And so as clinicians, as social workers, you want to avoid attaching labels to your clients, even though this may be required for the purposes of billing. For one thing, one of the criticisms of the DSM-5 is that the pharmaceutical industry had too much influence. In fact, 69% of task members had direct ties to the pharmaceutical industry. And this is one of the criticisms about over diagnoses. The belief is that the text was written in such a way that it implies that relatively normal or non-serious behavior requires treatment and thus, therefore, medication. The other thing that just of note, perhaps, about one of the disadvantages of the DSM-5 is that there were no social workers who were formally invited to participate in the task force or work groups. Only once uh, Dr. Janet Williams was meaningfully included in the updates, and even though the APA has grown into a multidisciplinary group of scientists and clinicians that's meant to be inclusive, including counseling, neuropsychology, biology, special education, epidemiology, and even public health, the voice of the social worker is conspicuously absent. Does using the DSM to diagnose clients run contrary to social work ethics? What do you believe? Does using the DSM to diagnose clients run contrary to the social work ethics in SAW code. Please share in the chat room. Does using the DSM to diagnose clients run contrary to the social work ethic? No, says no, no. I'm sure this is all no, and I'm not suggesting that it is, but I want to suggest that it's worthy of looking. So in the respect for the dignity and worth of all people from the NSAW Code of Ethics, uh, we see that uh, we may be in conflict because diagnosing mental illnesses is an exercise in judging clients and focusing on their pathologies and on their weaknesses. So if you diagnose a client with schizophrenia, for instance, you're highlighting a problematic factors of this person's life 
And you're also stigmatizing others to possibly to be led to believe that this person may be suffering hallucinations or delusions or paranoia or other cognitive dysfunctions that render them unable to work, for example. Uh, and then there are conditions such as depression or borderline personality disorder and autism spectrum disorder that can also label clients with undesirable traits and with undesirable judgments against them. So does using the DSM to diagnose affect the ethics of respect and dignity for all people? Why or why not? Does using the DSM to diagnose affect the ethics of respect and dignity for all people? Why or why not? Jessica Payne says, I don't think so. I feel that not, she underscores, using any resource available to understand and then help a person would not be ethical. It is loaded, so should only be entrusted to people who know how to ethically use it. Thank you, Ms. Payne. You should teach this class. Well said. Let's look at one particular person and see if we're respecting the worth and dignity of Shannon. She comes in to see you. She's 41. She reports that she's been irritable, short-tempered, and tired for the past couple of months. She says she's been less patient and she's been less engaged with her friends and family lately. She's not sleeping well. She wakes up several times every night and she's tired when she gets up in the morning. She's gained weight and has stopped exercising. She doesn't know what's wrong and has a hard time imagining she'll ever feel like herself again. She has a long history of disrupted relationships beginning in early adulthood. She often feels others aren't there for her, reports that she is always supportive and there for her friends. She struggles with feeling alone and worries that she'll be abandoned. She's had several jobs and can't decide on a direction in her life. She often struggles with her identity and seems to reinvent herself periodically. Sometimes she ends up cutting herself, not as a suicide attempt, but to stop her emotional pain. Along with recent job loss, her financial situation is getting worse. She's been evicted from her apartment and she's staying with various friends. Yes, by the use of the word all. Thank you, Ms. Ward. So if we're using the DSM, this is what we see for Shannon. And this is all she sort of becomes to us is some codes and some labels. So Shannon is reduced to 296.22 major depressive disorder, single episode moderate, and 301.83 borderline personality disorder. What have we done for Shannon is my question. Does using the DSM to diagnose concerns the ethics of non-judgmentalism? Why or why not? Does using the DSM to diagnose concern the ethics of non-judgmentalism? Why or why not? Respect, says Janine Bowen. Yes, says Ms. Kroll. Thank you all for participating and you're new to us. I Glad you're here. I hope you'll come back in the new year. Well, some diagnoses are ethical or ethically justifiable, we would suggest to you, under the principle of beneficence. Providing a diagnosis can serve a client by providing a framework, as we mentioned earlier, for selecting appropriate interventions. We can serve clients by providing them with a medical label rather than a moral label, which they may feel they're suffering under. And with addictions, this would be using substance use disorder as a medical condition, rather than the moral weakness of labeling them an alcoholic or an addict, which comes with its own charged meanings to other people, implying that the person has frailties, lacks willpower, is lazy, is irresponsible. Social workers, we would say, should avoid language that reduces person to a diagnosis, as in he is a borderline personality or she is a schizophrenic. Rather, we would suggest you would say he is a person with a borderline personality disorder or she is coping with schizophrenia. 
We want for social workers to provide holistic assessments, not just focusing on the problems or psychopathologies. Holistic assessments that will have within them highlight client strengths and consider the client in context of their social environment, including their support system. The holistic assessment, yes, it provides psychological functioning and problems, but it also includes social functioning, spirituality, physical health, and coping abilities. So, does using the DSM to diagnose serve to empower clients? Why or why not? This is a little trickier. Does using the DSM to diagnose serve to empower clients? Why or why not? Well, empowerment, as you know, is providing clients with the time and the space and the support and anything else that allows them to gain greater control over their lives. So empowerment then demonstrates respect for the dignity and worth of the client, treats the client as an autonomous individual with the right to make choices and decisions throughout the helping process. This is from the NSAW Code of Ethics, Standard 1.02. When using the DSM to diagnose, you then as a social worker have assumed the role of expert and you are now taking responsibility for determining which mental conditions clients have. And this flies in the face of involving the client as a full partner in the decision-making process. So if you inform your client that he has depression, rather than invite your client to jointly explore whether he may have concerns regarding depression, you may be applying the DSM in an unethical way. So providing the diagnosis can in fact disempower clients, and this can only be mitigated by the manner in which we conduct this diagnosis. So we want to educate the client about the diagnostic process, allowing them to be more equal in the discussion, providing them with information about depression, including possible indicators, and including tools that can help the person decide for themselves if they have depression, a uh, depression, excuse me, and if so, which treatment plan may make the most sense in concert with you. Regardless, we want for you and the client to agree. If you disagree about a diagnosis, we want you to document that as well. Um, and that would be our suggestion to you throughout using the DSM is documentation, document, document, document. In this case, for example, if you disagreed with your client, you might say something like, the client scored a 38 on Beck's depression inventory, indicating severe depression. The client says she does not think she is depressed because she does not feel suicidal. And then you want to, in your documentation, explore why the client may be denying that particular diagnosis. It may be that she has cultural or personal concerns, that that's a taboo or negative subject, or it may be that your client, who's astute, has questions about the validity of your method using the DSM. For example, the DSM-5 omitted a number of diagnostic categories from the DSM-4 because they lacked validity and or research. So who's to say that the current diagnostic categories are valid or will be considered valid in 10 years? The only real trick here is that we have to have the codes. So we have to explain to our client, here is why we're seeking a diagnosis. These services and any services for treatment options will need to be covered by the payer source and the payer source needs to see these codes. If you can explain that as well as the possible risk and benefits, then you give the opportunity for your client to truly provide informed consent which is the standard 1.03 in the code of ethics. Now, if your client does not want to be diagnosed, maybe you could then discuss alternatives where a DSM diagnosis is not required, such as certain group therapies or other things for depression. 
Are you confident using the DSM to diagnose? And Ms. Allen says, I would think it would vary on a case-by-case -case basis. Some may feel empowered, while others may find it defeating. Uh, Janine Bowen says it absolutely empowers clients and healthcare providers. So I'll ask all of you now, are you confident using the DSM to diagnose? Are you confident using the DSM to diagnose? Yes, says Ms. Bowen. I wish I had your knowledge. Well, the professional competence standard in the Code of Ethics 1.04 says workers should not diagnose clients unless they have appropriate training, supervision, knowledge, and skills, as well as licensing. And if a worker lacks competence or accreditation, avoid language then in your documentation that suggests that you've diagnosed a client. Stating a client has depression, for instance, indicates a diagnosis. Instead, you want to, in your documentation, list the indicators of depression for your client, but not your conclusion that the client is depressed. And then you want to document and refer some the client to someone who is properly qualified in your determination to make such a diagnosis. Somewhat, oh, let's see, somewhat, with supervision, not quite, but getting there, no, need more training, no. Ms. Allen, I thought you knew a lot about it uh, from your previous answer. But, you know, the thing I've learned about anything that you know is that the more you know, the more you know that you don't know. It's so always such a more bigger and complex topic than anything we ever realize when we learn something. Does using the DSM to diagnose upset your primary duty of care to clients? Does using the DSM to diagnose upset your primary duty of care to clients? Why or why not? Does using the DSM to diagnose upset your primary duty of care? Why or why not? Well, social workers owe their primary duty of care to the client. So I think this, as someone said before, would be on a case-by-case -case basis. You want to consider in each case whether the diagnosis is truly in the client's best interest. So yes, providing a diagnosis would ensure the client access to services, but what if the diagnosis serves the agency or your needs, but not necessarily your client's? What if the diagnosis causes the client more stress, anxiety, guilt, or shame than it offers help? What if diagnosing a client might cost that client a job or the ability to obtain future employment? Now, it is true that the ADA, American Disabilities Act, provides and prohibits discrimination on the base of any disability, including mental illness, yet discrimination does arise and the only way to uh, combat it is to go to court on behalf of that person. And that's just often not practical. So we would say that it is possible that providing clients a DSM diagnosis could cause harm. In fact, even though it's an integral part of your agency, uh, it may be something to which you've given little thought about how causing harm. Uh, and it is, as you know, required for agency reimbursement, but there can be alternatives. For one thing, you could provide services without a diagnosis, and you might document that the client would decide to reject services rather than receive psychiatric diagnosis. Uh, you might have the feeling that the DC DSM is too complex, it's too incoherent, and it's, not incons and it's inconsistent with current research. You want to be particularly cautious about controversial diagnostic categories like disruptive mood regulation disorder or major depressive disorder or substance use disorder or binge eating disorder. Um, and you also want to uh, be very careful if you're rating and making a diagnosis, rating a diagnosis is mild, medium, or severe. In fact, if it is a mild form, you want to be very cautious and careful about diagnosing this mild disorder as there is a thin line separating normal functioning and the mild form. 
And if it's a substance use disorder, as we said, and it's very mild in your mind, then does it warrant the diagnosis that will stay on this client's records for the rest of their lives? Using the word seems or appears it is helpful to those who cannot diagnose. Thank you, Ms. Bowen. Referral to the social worker. What might I need to consider before using the DSM to diagnose? What might I need to consider before using the DSM to diagnose? I would suggest you would ask yourself this series of questions. I pulled this from a, a board in Ontario, I believe. Uh, do I have appropriate education and training to diagnose using DSM-5? Do I have a thorough understanding on how to use the DSM-5 to diagnose? For what purpose would I need to diagnose using DSM-5? Am I using the DSM-5 in understanding symptomology and guiding intervention? Or am I using it to provide a diagnosis? And how am I communicating this to my client? How would the diagnosis impact my work with this client? Do I have access to supervision and or consultation on the DSM-5? And how do I incorporate this as part of my informed consent process with clients? Well, there are some other alternatives to the DSM-5. And I know that many of you said, or some of you said you use uh, the DSM as a guideline. So there are other texts that you may want to look at. One is the Psychodynamic Diagnostic Manual, or PDM, which appeared in 2006. And this is an approach that was done by clinicians, clinical psychologists, I believe it was. And the approach is one in which they aim to describe the dimensions of the patient's overall functioning and then ways in which this might influence the therapeutic process for the patient. So it comes at it from a different way. There's the hierarchical taxonomy of psychopathology or high top, a dimensional alternative to traditional nosology. Nosology is simply the study of disease, what causes disease. So this views mental disorders as being a spectra and it classifies illnesses at multiple levels of hierarchy within that spectra. So the broad level captures the major, and the specific level is very tightly knit dimensions within that broader spectrum. There's the research domain criteria, RDOC. This came out from the National Institute of Mental Health, and it's based on personalized medicine. It's biologically based. And so rather than symptom-based, the framework for understanding mental disorders is through the medical history and the biology. And then there's the power threat meaning framework, which was appeared in 2018. This is a group of clinical psychologists in the British Psychological Society. And this replaces diagnostic labels altogether with a system that assesses how power, what has happened to a person, leads to threat, the social, psychological, biological impacts of power and meaning which is the ways people make sense of what has happened to them, power. And then there are others who may want to consult the ICD-11, however, knowing that the codes are exactly the same as those in the DSM-5. So the DSM-5 remains the standard, but as we've talked and you've verified, it's one of many tools for proper diagnosis and treatment there's no substitute for your professional judgment, hence the questions I've posed to you today. The DSM is not the only tool. We've shared some others, and you may find other instruments more appealing or more helpful for gathering information and developing a better understanding of your client than the DSM-5, but it can be used in conjunction very well with other tools. The DSM diagnosis is a fact of life, and so the best way to mitigate the risk to you as a clinician 
using the DSM to diagnose is by adhering to your ethical principles as social workers, namely respecting the dignity and worth of your clients, empowering your clients, putting your clients' interests first, and if a diagnosis is required, ensuring that that diagnostic process is conducted by a professional with appropriate knowledge and skill, which may be you. Mr. Lester says it might also be noteworthy to ascertain if a previous diagnosis was rendered by a clinical psychologist, psychiatrist, or PCP. Thank you all for participating today. Oops, that is the end of our day. I'm sorry it's a short day, but Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, Happy Kwanzaa, Happy Hanukkah. Our code word is all capital letters, DSM5TR. And our survey link again is https colon forward slash forward slash www dot survey monkey dot com forward slash lowercase r forward slash all uppercase letters y h five n as in Nancy h g as in girl P as in play. If you can, please try and do your evaluations by eight o'clock this evening as I can get those out quicker. Uh, I do provide slides to everyone uh, who receives uh, an evaluation certificate. You get the PowerPoint and the YouTube will have this and about a hundred other CEUs you can watch for credit up. If you go to YouTube and just type in the search bar, Sean Barnes Care Patrol, you'll see me come up, click on my face. You'll see tons of other CEUs come up, which you can take for free for credit. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, and uh, thank you for everything that you do. Thank you for referring us and for keeping us in the top of your mind when you have clients who need guidance or advocacy around aging issues. Uh, we appreciate you. I hope you have a very Merry Christmas and a very Happy New Year. And I look forward to seeing you again on January 6th when we resume our series with best practices in social work supervision. Everyone have a great week and we'll see you in January. Well, I'm having trouble ending, y'all. Mm -hmm.